This is a conversation I had with Swole a while ago. I've been looking forward to reposting it. It was the first contradiction to ever take place at Theory Underground. A contradiction is a contradiction conversation, but it's not a debate because it's not meant to be where like a side wins or whatever. The only person who's going to win is the person who's trying to figure things out for themselves. So I dedicate this one to Mandy. Mandy listens to a lot of Theory Underground's content, has been a tier three subscriber for several months, and she asked me about Marxism. She was asking me what it means to be a Marxist, what it means to be influenced by Marx, like what is what is that? And so this is a really great place if you're wondering those kinds of questions. If you're wondering how I'm influenced by Marx but do not consider myself a Marxist and why it is that I still maintain uh, relationships with some Marxists such as Swolitariat here. And so, look, I love Swole. Uh, we've always had our disagreements, but I don't know. There's something about him. He knows how to have disagreements. Uh I mean, maybe not on Twitter, but, you know, definitely when it comes to actual conversations. And so, yeah, love it. I hope you will all enjoy it as well. And if you're curious about what Theory Underground is or how to get more involved, stick around until the end because I have like this commercial thing that I like to play at the end. It's like a PSA about, you know, what we're up to, what Theory Underground is all about, what it does, et cetera. There's lots of courses coming up. There's lots of really exciting things going on. This is July, baby. Lots of really cool stuff is happening in July. The monthly subscribers have access to a bunch of really awesome lectures and significant discounts on the courses taught by myself as well as other instructors at Theory Underground, including Todd McGowan, Chris Catrone, Benjamin Studebaker, Michael Downs, Etc. 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 Enjoy. All right, everybody. Welcome to Theory Underground. I'm your host, David McCarricker. But today, I mean, this conversation, this segment of this epic live stream marathon on April 18th, 2024, is going to be sort of refereed by Nance, even though I don't think it's going to be necessary. Swole and I are going to be modeling the first of these contradiction conversations from today. We don't have the full time that some of these later ones like McManus and Spencer Leonard are going to have, or like Todd McGowan and Chris Catrone, or like uh, the Becoming Human Project Samuel Longcar uh, with Justin Murphy from The Other Life. They each get an hour and a half. We get an hour. And we're already starting late because I apparently didn't send the Link to you soon enough, Eamon. My my bad. So this is kind of the conversation before the conversation where we're just going to talk a little bit about our development um, uh, with, political, with political things, philosophical things, whatever. We both used to call ourselves Marxists. Swole still does. I don't. Uh, and, uh, but let's first get into like where you got that name, that nickname Swole. Um, and, uh, and how we met and I'll let you just take it away. Introduce yourself however you like, man. Yeah. So I started watching YouTube, um, I don't know, uh, eight years ago or so. And, uh, I remember around the Trump Trump's first election, I really wanted to, uh, I guess I'd gotten into video essays. Anyway, I really wanted to make my own video essay and I wanted to do a political YouTube channel. Cause I, my, I was, uh, I was a baby Marxist and I had a uh, politics, uh, political science degree from university. And I wanted to, to kind of join the fray and fill a space that I thought was, was not being attended to. And that was kind of a, uh, a Marxist or at least a class conscious leftist position that was counter to uh, at the time, what would have been called social, ju social justice warriors, um, postmodernism and yeah I so I saw a lot of problems with what I saw on the left and so I wanted to be I didn't see many many voices critiquing uh that that stuff from a uh, a Marxist perspective or even like a social democratic uh left position and so I started my channel I'm a, I'm also a personal trainer I own a gym currently so I I figured well maybe I can mix somehow fitness and um and politics and Marxism together. So I created the Swolitariat channel, 
eventually got onto Twitter, which has been the bane of my existence. And I've I've evolved quite a bit since uh, since I started. Uh, the first video I did was my most most viral video, and that was like <laughs> that was on uh, explaining why uh, Hillary Clinton was a better vote than Donald Trump at the time, and why you were an idiot if you if you didn't realize that. Of course, I've totally totally fl- <laughs> changed my ways or my thoughts on the on those topics, um, but. A lot of the same kind of attitude and um, and uh, uh, yeah, maybe just attitude, I guess. Uh, I still implement um, in in how I go about taking on opponents and uh, and and dealing with ideas. And uh, yeah, then I joined a Marxist organization, the uh, revolutionary organization, the uh, IMT, International Marxist Tendency in Canada. And that's where I got the bulk of my political education. And, but at the same time, I was interested in stuff uh, in philosophy. And I was in a philosophy club in my local city. And I discovered Dave's channel. I followed some other philosophy channels. Um, and anyway, where, what I where I've come to is kind of thinking that the 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 revolutionary Marxists, who I mean, I was in a Trotskyist organization, but in general, they are in many ways stuck in uh you know thinking with with from the perspective of lenin trotsky marx angles people from 100 years ago or more um and you know they update their their analysis for you know for the conditions of today supposedly but they don't really think outside the box um and they like to stick inside their box and i think they they i think they miss a lot so i i in my view the 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 Marxists, the Orthodox Marxists, are missing uh, a, a lot, and I think they could gain a lot from from opening up to theory and uh, not just uh, decrying them all as academic Marxists or petty bourgeois intellectuals. Um, at the same time, the ac- the uh, the petty bourgeois intellectuals uh, in our presence today at, at Theory Underground, um, I think they could use a little bit of of uh, you know a little bit of extra Lenin, Trotsky, and kind of uh, in that anal- and then revolutionary analysis and, and a little bit of uh maybe I don't know if it's optimism oh shoot I just lost my okay we're gonna have to be without uh my camera for a bit oh my god um yeah it's I think, okay well it, it over it overheats and I was just on a call right before this so we'll, we'll have to let it cool down and I'll turn it back on um Anyway, yeah. So I think each side is missing a bit of each other. Like sometimes I, I listen to conversations here with you and Mikey and Nance and and other people you have on the channel. I'm like, well, you know, th- some of these things are answered already in in, <laughs> in 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 thinking about this these things from a you know a revolutionary Bolshevik way or even just analysis of previous uh, uh, you know revolutionary moments all around the world, not just from a hundred years ago, but the, even in in more uh, contemporary times. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's more or less my story. Cool, man. Well, it's good to have you, and it's been a while since you've actually just been on for a regular <clears throat> conversation. We do the weekly sessions, the Solitariat Health and Fitness um, check-ins, where it's like you're our personal trainer and subscribers at a certain tier, get access to these conversations where they can just kind of check in and we talk about our failures, our successes, and our goals for the week, which is good because I'm a flabby intellectual. I'm not, okay, come on. I'm not really, but also like, I'm not as physical as I would be if I wasn't uh, into theory, right? Um, And so I spend a lot more time being docile because I'm into this stuff. It's like, uh, instead of racing myself, it's my mind that is racing. Kind of, kind of what Helen Rollins, when she was on, what she kind of, what she said, right? Because she was literally racing, and then she couldn't anymore, and so she took that energy into uh, theory. Well, um, let's see. I was a baby leftist back in twenty. 20, I guess 20, well, I probably was a baby left since 2020. And no, I, I started like, I kind of stopped identifying as left in 2020. Um, that wasn't 
at the same time, like that I started identifying as post left, I was paying attention to those people, but I also am not happy with that as an alternative because what I see there is a new identity. And I'm, I'm the kind of person who's very susceptible for a new identity. Oh, that makes sense of my life. And then I'll try it on and then instantly be like, uh, actually that's bullshit. Uh, think, you know, and I'll just keep shedding layer after layer like a snake. Right. And it's just like, okay, maybe actually let's use something less, less, uh, Slytherin related. I, I would like to think that I leave behind, uh, my caterpillar and cocoon stages and I become a like a, a like gay little butterfly. That's what I become. Um, I'm not this little, I'm not this little snake, but I'm this little butterfly. I've, I've evolved. I would like to think, I mean, I know that, uh, Eamon said he has evolved. You can't really tell from his Twitter, but I believe that he has, <laughs> um, that's, uh, I mean, all he does on Twitter is call people retards and then post pictures of people's bios and make fun of, <laughs> of their, uh, their like, Oh, look, they're checking all the boxes. Ha, ha, ha. And I understand him better now because I've been to his house and I realized that he does Twitter from the couch with a giant screen TV. And it's like, okay, so it really is like this is your your entertainment at the end of the day is laughing at the people who think that their bullshit on Twitter is somehow changing things. But of course, that's not your real uh, work that you're doing in terms of your own development. And so I don't think people should judge you off of that any more than they should judge anybody off their tweets. Don't, I mean, if you judge people off your tweets, you're already like not in the conversation we're having because nobody here cares about what you tweet. Um, but with that said, um, so I was saying I was a baby leftist. Well, when, uh, probably like, I think a year, the year that I was in recovery from burning out on the previous stage of my life where all I cared about was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I was getting into psychedelics and blah, blah, blah. And it all kind of just like, I bottomed out with all of that stuff and I was kind of over it, but I hadn't like, I didn't figure out where I was going yet. And I was basically in that cocoon stage of being a bunch of goo. Um, and I was on tour with some, some of my friends from the music scene I was in. Um, they were in a band. I was the roadie. Um, and we were going through Seattle and, uh, that, you know, there was some, there was a tour stop in Seattle and we were all hanging out at this anarchist squat and they were all talking about, uh, Occupy related things. I didn't understand anything they were talking about. I remember being high and just thinking, it sounds interesting, but I didn't really go any deeper than that. I didn't really follow along. Um, one of my friends from back then was having a great conversation with them all. And he was always someone whose ideas had seemed a little bit more, uh, qualified. And so, you know, I started to be like, wow, like what kind of conversations are these that they're having? And so I started paying more attention to that friend after that. And then he went to college. And I remember thinking like, what are you selling out? Because they were, they were in this like, sort of punk band and they were like super, super elitist. And here he was going to college. And I remember thinking like, what the hell? And he's like, well, you know, I'm spending, I'm getting, I'm going into a ton of student loan debt and then I'm using the student loan debt for tattoos and all I'm studying is political philosophy. So it actually makes sense. And I was like, uh, okay. So I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Cause here I was like thinking, what am I doing with my life? I can't keep working a job like this. Like all of these jobs that I've tried to do in my own business and everything, it's not getting me anywhere. I, I don't see a way out. I don't see a way forward. I was completely given up. I was like super depressed for like months that year, months consecutively. Never, never before have I bottomed out that way. That's, and, and I was like, well, you know what? I'd go to college if it wasn't so expensive because it's the political philosophy stuff sounds interesting at least. And he was like, yeah, man, well, you could get a Pell Grant you know, you're poor. You're the first person in your family to go to college. You could get a Pell Grant. What's a Pell Grant? You know, so I, I look into it and it's something Obama had expanded to more people to include me. Of course, at the exact same time that he expanded it, it also stopped covering everybody's full tuition. I think that's been gradual. So it's not Obama's fault. I'm not saying thanks, Obama, on this one. But uh, it was, you know, it's gradually ceased to cover the full tuition ceased to cover half tuition 
cease to cover. I mean, maybe now it co can cover like a quarter of the tuition. Like I'd probably owe a hundred grand if it wasn't for the Pell Grant combined with the different kinds of scholarships that I got on the basis of merit, but also on the basis of first generation, blah, blah, blah. Poor, low income, however you say. All of that was sort of my my gateway into philosophy, which I did not understand at all. And my my politics was like, oh, I've I wish people had better lives and I don't like conservatives and I tend to like people who are liberal. That was pretty much what, where it was at at the time. I used to like progressives until I went to the university and then the university kind of was like, oh, this is a different kind of progressive. Like a progressive in the workspace was like one thing. A progressive in the university as we started to enter social justice activism right? Like that became a different thing. And I remember sitting down in a class, first day of class, and the student in front of me, well, I did I couldn't see a her. It was just the back of her head, right? I, I wasn't even noticing her. I, there's this guy beside me. I'd never talked to him before. We'd struck up a conversation. He said something about coming from the ghetto bench, which is a part of Boise, right? The bench is like kind of ghetto. And so he was talking about coming from the ghetto bench and she stands up and turns around and goes, how fucking dare you? And <laughs> we were both like, uh, what? And she's just like, you're a white fucking man and you have the audacity to say something about a ghetto bitch. And, uh, you know, so he kind of is like, he, he tries to like, he, he, tries, he tries to play it cool, you know, like when someone else fucks up, and you don't want to like make them eat it. So he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I was saying the ghetto bench. And she's like, well, it doesn't matter anyway, like instantly. Well, it doesn't matter anyway because you're white. You shouldn't be saying ghetto. And he was like, I'm from there. And then the teacher walked in and everyone turned and focused on the, the and I was like thinking, I was like, did that just happen? And then I started to see more and more of this. And it just started to grow and like become more of a thing. Like when I was at my under, like when I was in my first two years at college, like it was, it was very like, there's the atheist kind of socialist friendly sort of libertarian philosophy club with a couple of oddball Catholics. And I was a president of that club. And then there was this other club very active on campus called Campus Alive in Christ. And they were super cringe and lame. And they were, they were a bunch of douchebags because they would go around and tell people stories about us. And I'm sure we weren't great to them either because I was in a new atheist phase at the time. I, I admit um, my shit was very superficial at the time. I, I it, It's true. So, you know, we were all kids, whatever. Um, but, but that was the contradiction there was like, oh, they're conservative and Christian and we're like sort of left-ish and cool. <laughs> and probably not for the most part, like atheists, except for these, you know, big brain, you know, Catholics who'd hang out with us. And then I go to Boise State University, which is a whole different dynamic. See, it's the difference between North Idaho and South Idaho. In North Idaho, it's just like there's Christians and there's atheists and everybody's kind of libertarian. And some people are more Republican in their libertarianism. Other people are more Democrat. Uh, you go to Boise State, it's a blue island in a red sea, right? It's the capital city of the of the the state, and it's a very red state. And so the 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 blue people are extremely like reactive and they come here for combat. Like they like a, like if they are politically conscious and they say they're gonna go to Boise State, they're they're like, I'm coming to do combat basically. And it's like, so you get like this kind of deranged, uh, activism that's, it's just, I mean, it really is unhinged and, uh, comparing that to my experience from North Idaho college, it was, it was, it was really interesting. And so that's, I think why I appreciated your stuff. Swole was like seeing that stuff at Boise state. Mikey always says like, he didn't really see that stuff, you know, in uh, Raytown, Missouri. He didn't really see that stuff in Kansas city. He just saw it online, you know, cringe, you know, SJW cringe reels. But as soon as you realize like there are actual institutions where if you're a white guy, you're going to have to be some fucking, 
something fucking special. You're going to have to be something special to even get heard. And of course, like, I, you know, I'd create my own little spaces where we could have serious conversations. But uh, in the general spaces held by that institution, uh, it's an uphill battle just to be heard, just to be able to engage in, in conversation and, 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 and people take it seriously and think about it, as opposed to just like, oh my God, a white guy's talking. And so I found that very alienating. And I, uh, in my undergrad, uh, had read Marx. And, uh, you know, back at the, you know, the North Idaho College, I, it was because these like, you know, Campus Alive and Christ people were telling everybody that we were like these crazy socialists or whatever, that like one of the board of trustees came up and was like, I heard that you guys are like these atheist socialists, like corrupting the minds of the youth. But then he actually threatened us. Like at first I thought it was all kind of convivial, but then he actually threatened us. Like the dude actually told me point blank that if I crossed him, like he could have me taken out. Like it was actually crazy stuff. Like this guy's wild, like cuckoo banana bread. And I and I, I spent the whole summer th- soaking on that, thinking about this guy and, and, and talking with my friend who is the vice president of that club. And we weren't really socialists. We were just like left-leaning and we didn't have a well-defined politics because we were philosophically just working through things and thinking at the time. But the class that I'd met him in, this is Steven. He's never been on the channel, but he's a cool guy. Steven and I, we're, we're, we, we both came out of this political philosophy class where Marx had not been treated fairly, but Rousseau had. John Locke had. Uh, Thomas Hobbes had. Uh, Machiavelli had. Plato and Aristotle had. Uh, even John Rawls. We spent more time taking John Rawls seriously than we did Marx. And so it's like, I was very well aware that even though I didn't know what this politi- this professor's politics were, I was like, there's something about him that makes him not like Marx because he had to seriously read all of these other people. And then he has us do cliff notes on Marx. And it's this very like, oh, he believes that history is a train and it's going to go in this direction. And all we can do is speed it up and help the process. And that's basically what he is. And he just sees things this way. And I read the manifesto and I wasn't impressed. I spent my whole life working. It didn't really speak to me. Um, but then I wanted to get more. I knew that there must be more to him. And so I tracked down Bruce Bierman, who's been on this channel at least once. Uh, there's a video you can find of Ann and I interviewing him in Spokane, Washington in a coffee shop. Uh, he's amazing. And basically I was like, oh, you like Marx? Oh, crazy. And you're like into Kierkegaard and anarchism? How do you like Marx when you're into that stuff? And then it turns out he also likes the Bible. And I was like, how do you like all of those things? That doesn't make any sense. And he was just like, you got to read Kant and Heidegger, man. I can't explain things to you, but I could give you some lectures on on Marx. And so basically we put together some lectures on Marx and uh, he, we you know, invited the whole campus. And it was kind of like a way to like get back at this uh, board of trustees guy for threatening us. We had the, the fall semester begins and there's these giant posters with Marx's image plastered all over the campus. And it says free pizza, like a hundred people show up. You know, it's like a really big event. And of course, people are just interested in the blood sport aspect of it all. But then it turns into this big intellectual thing. And we say, hey, there's going to be three follow up meetings once per month where we're going to be we'll be reading specific texts uh, that Bierman is going to assign us. And then he's going to talk about Marx. And I got Marx pilled on all of that. And so it kind of like in Talladega Nights when they, you know, well, it's my Jesus. You know, I have my baby Jesus. You have your Jesus. We all have our own idea of Jesus. You can't keep yawning while I'm talking. It's very rude, Swole. You're basically foiling. We can't have a real conversation here if you're going to yawn when I talk. No more of this or you get booted from the stream. No, I'm just kidding. Um, You sounded like my French teacher. Did she tell you to stop yawning at her? (laughs) In university, yeah. Every every day I yawned every every morning and she would get mad at me. There's a thing called manners. You're supposed to cover it up. But okay. Um, Yeah. That's what she said. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put it, put it away. Um, well, in the same way that in Talladega Nights, he says, well, it's baby Jesus for me. I have my version of Marx. I like my version of Marx. I really don't like anyone else's version of Marx. And my version of Marx is at the library for 10 years studying that British Museum library, studying the 
you know, socialism from Fr and, and anarchism from France. He's studying political economy. He's already been studying philosophy for 10 years at this point. He's studying Mill, Ricardo, and Smith at the same time that he's like deeply ensconced in the Hegelian mil milieu and having active conversations with people from that milieu as well as these other ones. And, and he's trying to figure out the situation and he's got a bunch of operating assumptions. I like that, Marx. What I don't like is worldview Marxism that takes those operating assumptions and says, based, true, done, just need to do the same thing again. And I think that Lenin did that. I think Lenin was like, based, true, good, I got it. And then just ran with it. And it worked out for a hot minute because nobody was home when they went to the freaking palace. And so, of course, they were able to take over for a hot sec. But then the whole world reacted in the way that it fucking obviously would have reacted and then they spent the next 20 years crying about how it didn't go according to plan and how the revolution was betrayed inside and outside. And it's like, duh, obviously that was going to happen, dude. Now I can be sympathetic, but I shouldn't have to be sympathetic because the only people who want me to be sympathetic here are the people who are trying to say that our proper interpretation of history just needs to be more widely understood and then the working class can be returned to its former glory. And I don't think that's a reasonable way forward. Even if you guys are right 100% about everything you guys say, it's still not a reasonable way forward. I've got a lot of reasons for thinking that it's not a way forward uh, on the basis of even if you guys uh, were correct, but also I just don't think you guys are correct. And so that opens like a huge, huge field for us to have a productive conversation in, I think. Because I, I, my post-Marxism is just to say like, yeah, this image of Marx going hard is like what I like. Uh, but every great theorist since him hasn't been a Marxist for a reason. Every fucking great thinker since him hasn't been a Marxist for a reason. And then you could be like, well, what about Lukács? What about Adorno? And it's like, yeah, sort of, sort of, sort of maybe. But the situation has changed. That's my position. The situation has changed in fundamental ways. Uh, class, class composition has changed. The medium has changed. The relation between superstructure and base has changed. The way that base is organized has been changed. Um, and we could just get into this for like three hours and I'd like to, probably in June is kind of my invitation to you is to like come back to it. Um, and of course, I don't want this to be a conversation that where it's like, oh, one of us has to win. I think the only people who are going to win from contradiction conversations are going to be the audience members who get to see contradictions um, articulate themselves vis-a-vis -vis the other who can be there to question and also set the record straight if that other is being misconstrued. And so if I'm misconstruing your positions on things um, or you mind that we'll be able to over time address that, hopefully so that other people can have their own education accelerated because I don't care what you all believe. This is just where I'm at. And I love Swole. You guys can't dissuade me of this, even though he's going to be called a transphobe until the end of history. I don't care. I love him. And uh, that's where I'm at. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff about that academia story and my coming into fruition and how I got into being a bread tuber and how Swole like started following all my stuff and commenting on everything back in the day. And then he like made a video about his favorite bread tubers that were small and underrated. And I was one of them. You're muted by the way. And then, yeah, there, there's a lot that goes into that backstory and then like ways that he's had my back in situations and just stuff. But for now, I want to just stay at the level of theory and just say, yeah, getting post Marxist was really just like, well, seven years of Bernie activism. I don't think the Marxists ever had anything real to offer. I don't, th I, I was always like, yeah, I love Marx, but you guys aren't doing it and you don't have anything real to offer, but they always come around with a gleam in their eye. Like they've got the secrets of the universe answered and I don't fucking think they do. And then they're always trying to hijack everything and infiltrate groups and break them up. And there's just like this actual weird dynamic with, uh, within the DSA, outside of the DSA. I left the DSA after starting a chapter because I got super disillusioned on their bullshit, of course, in 2019, but it's worse um, when I just want Medicare for all, all right? I don't care about the rest of the bullshit. And they're like, just doing their stupid Marxoid shit. I was just like, stop guys. Like you guys are assuming that there's a working class when there's not one. There is a post-class fractured mass. And if we can get some kind of class, pseudo class consciousness together enough that we could get some healthcare, that would be nice. But I was being sneered at for seven years and it pissed me off concerning Marxists. But you 
And Tut and Lane and Catrone are like pretty much the people holding the line. And the reason that I say, ah, it's still worth it to talk to Marxists because they have, they actually have a lot they can still teach us. All right, there you go. What do you want to do with that? What would you say if you were to steel man what you think my position is on all this? What do you, what do you think I believe? What do you think I would say? You believe it's that the only way forward is Bolshevism. Okay. And Bolshevism requires a group of people taking over all of the power apparatuses and doing so in a way that's only really democratic at the committee meetings until the decision is made. And then everybody's supposed to be in lockstep after that decision is made, which makes sense during a period of war communism, uh, but doesn't make sense in a post-industrial democratic world. Okay. But I could get into that into, but that's not steel manning you. Um, but I don't think you could steel man me either. To be fair. I don't, I don't think you would, you do watch some of my stuff, but you haven't taken the requisite, the, the requisite courses at theory underground to really have what I mean by the situation, even like, like, uh, there yet. So, but my, my steel man to, to, to the best steel man I could probably do for you is to say, it ain't going to come from the Democrats. It ain't going to come from the Republicans. It definitely can't come from a third party. And by it, I don't even mean utopia. You don't mean utopia. You don't think that it's like salvation. You're not like a religiousoid kind of Marxist. I know that. And so to, to steel man you, the only practical way is going to break from what Americans consider to be dem democracy. Uh, and it can't be bottom up because that would just be more people at Seattle trying to start a Chaz. Um, it would be more Occupy. Uh, no, and it can't be these opportunistic politicians. It's going to have to come from people who actually study the material conditions and understand capitalism is the real problem. And yeah, they're going to face a lot of backlash. They're going to face a lot of hardship in trying to make something better. And so they're going to have to uh, deal with uh, probably the CIA, the NSA, the various military uh, apparatuses. They're going to have to deal with uh, all these politicians, the cops. Like they're, they're going to have at every side, uh, 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 like actual repressive forces being used against them, as well as uh, propaganda, which speaks for itself. If the work is already done, you know that that war is complete, as far as I'm concerned. But your the reason that your position makes sense, uh, as I've described it is because of the way Benjamin Studebaker talks about the situation here in the chronic crisis of American democracy, where it's just like the way, it, as it says, the way is shut. The tug of war between the two parties means that even if you get a Bernie in there, or even if you get a Cornel West in there, or even if you get like someone who's way more radical than that, and even if that person had the Senate in the House for like a hot sec, it's not going to matter because the system is made to so that anybody who gets significant advances on any of their political goals, that, that shit can all be retracted four to eight years later. And it just becomes this spiraling downward tug of war forever. And so like the way is shut. And so you're looking to the last time somebody said, ah, the way is shut. Well, let's kick the door through. And so to steel man, you, you're living in fidelity to an event where someone actually kicked the door through and you're like, well, they might not have been right about everything and we can learn from some of their mistakes, but we want to be able to kick the door through. And how are we going to do that if we don't organize with other people who agree with us on at least that, the fidelity to that event, which so, are yeah, there, I mean, th there isn't, there isn't an element of fidelity to, to one event in, in particular, especially with, with Bolshevism, but really what it is, is a fidelity to the, whole of the history of the working class and socialist struggle so that you know that includes all the experience from before from the 1905 revolution to all the revolutions and the failed revolutions before that that includes uh the paris commune that includes what happened in chile that includes um quebec 1970 whatever the hell it was that include like it, uh, it includes 1968 it includes every basically revolutionary moment where there was a where there was a possibility for not necessarily like you know world revolution or anything but a possibility for uh 
something from more progressive to to actually have emerged um and 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 at the end of the day that is going to the prerequisite for that the the necessary condition is going to be a party an independent uh work uh independent class party so something completely uh cut off from the democrats the the republicans in canada even today that what you'd have to say that have to would have to be cut off from you know even the uh, our workers party the ndp in britain it would have to be cut off from the labor party cuz cuz they there's no there's no more entryism in those parties that could get anywhere because th- those have become fully bourgeoisified um yeah. you would say um so that's the precondition but in in all your arguments about how um and and the anarchists would say you know how uh a vanguard of marxists and the party can be uh could can easily turn authoritarian or totalitarian um and and anti-democratic Oh, geez, we lost me again. Um, yeah, that that's always going to be a risk. There's an inherent risk in all that, and that's. But what I'm saying is that's that's going to be the risk you have to take. It's basically the going to be the only way forward. And uh, however we get there, um, it is going to involve. There will be unions involved, although it won't be like it was 100 years ago or even 50 years ago because unions like you said uh the working class is not the working class it's not a real working industrialized working class like it was 100 years ago and this uh actually could i get you to expand on what you mean by a post class fractured mass yeah basically and this is not going to do fair to the argument i do think that there's a couple years of working through the, these long form lectures and giant texts and then distilling that into something that's a lot more cogent. But for now, it's basically to say that people, it's not just like you and Ashley Frowley, for instance, would take the position that, oh, well, you know, what we need is people to work together and organize in their interests as a work, as the working class, um, as opposed to identity politics, right? Um, And you guys see identity politics as the thing that happens when there's like a void to be filled politically, when there's not an actual working class movement. It's going to deteriorate into identitarianism, reactionary on both sides. One one side will call it self-progressive, the other side will call it traditionalist, but they're both reactionary, um, identitarian. My position is that all we have immediately is identities. Um, And that's a functional product of the material system and the changes that occurred in the 20th century. That's not ideal. It's not a way forward. We can be realists about it. That doesn't mean we should embrace it. It also means I can be more sympathetic to people who do embrace it. I get where you're coming from if you're black and all you care about is uh, reparations and, and some affirmative action or whatever. It's like, I get it. I get that. I mean, I hate uh, organizing with people who are race reductionists because they're always just going to see me as a fucking white dude. And I hate that because I don't, obviously on the one level, I don't identify that way. Second, more importantly, there are more important things about me. And when those more important things about me get erased, I'm out. I'm just out. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to let anybody sun me. I'm not going to let anybody like talk down to me just because I'm supposed to take it, which I mean, in progressive circles, if you're a white dude, you're, you are supposed to take it. But also, I'm not going to go hang out with people who are like, yeah, we're oppressed because we're white. Because I think they're a bunch of lame douchebags on the internet. And I think that most of, mostly all we have is lame douchebags on the internet getting together in affinity groups, talking about how their life sucks and how nobody's like them. And we're all like oppressed. And you get conservatives who are doing it. You get progressives who are doing it, whatever. But I'm what I'm saying is that that's not because of the absence of a working class movement. It's because of the thing that caused the absence of the working class movement. The thing that caused the absence of the working class movement is the construction of the institutions and reconfiguration of political economy and culture that has produced the PMC at a material level. It's not that the PMC is able to be a scapegoat for a political movement. No, the, I think the PMC is the only way forward. 
I'm 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 from below, from above, from 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 reform, from revolution, from from all of the antagonisms that people focus on. I say they all have a little bit of the truth to them, but the PMC is closer to the levers of power and able to actually, uh, in some cases, get big money interests on the side of something that actually has some forward uh, possibility when in reality we don't have one. All of that's to say the post-class fractured, fras uh, fra oh my God, post -class ma uh, fractured <laughs> mass is the sort of Baudrillard pilled take on the situation, which is to say, this is not Hart and Negri's uh, multitude of the disenfranchised, the precariat, the lumpen proletarianized, and the fallen professionals banding together. No, the, the conditions for banding together are gone. And we have to be realists about it and then figure out what to do. And then the, the, the typical, oh, well, oh, we should just organize the workers. Yeah, but the workers are, they're not, they're not this homogenous, it was, they were homogenous and they actually did uh, have their hands on the levers of power um, at the time that Charles Dickens and Karl Marx were writing. But now we live in a world where they don't see each other the same. And it's not because of left versus right. It's not because of abortion versus pro-life. It's not because of trans versus trad. It's not because, no, it's because we are carved up in a million ways and not, not carved up at the level of, if you, it's like, do, I think it's unrealistic to get people to stop using the toilet and start using their lawns. I think it's unrealistic. I think it's more unrealistic to get people to fundamentally prioritize class at this point. And I think as a person who's been a class reductionist of some sort for like 10 years, what does that mean? And sitting with it and trying to ask what that means and therefore reading Leotard and Baudrillard and Gores and all of these other people while continuing to read Marx's greatest work, Das Kapital with the Grunrisse, and, and, and saying, well, what now? given that situation. And then I always say, but hey, maybe the Marxists are right and I'm wrong. It would be great if they're right. I just don't think that they are. They've been saying the same things for uh, over a hundred years. So it's not getting us anywhere. And I don't see a way forward uh, with that uh, set of operating assumptions without it getting called into question. So Right. Okay. So I, I, if we had time, I would want Nance to elaborate on what he means by the post-mass fractured class. And I, I think we should give him the final word as the pseudo referee here. Uh, but we actually have to close this thing out in like four minutes. And so I'm going to give you the floor, Swole, and let you set the set, set up the next conversation, basically. Um, so you, you basically get to set the terms of the conversation. You get the last word besides Nance kind of just letting you all, letting us all know his thoughts, but yeah, do with it as you will. Okay. So there's a couple things to put a couple threads to pick up on there. Now you said earlier that, that the Marxist position is that, uh, we, we just want the, our understanding of the world and capitalism to be more, if, if it only were, were, were more more widely understood and accepted if we got people to prioritize class that this this would be this would be the way for it this is kind of an idealist conception though right like marxist marxists talk about like the, it's capitalism itself the conditions itself the crises themselves and um that that are going to push forward uh people not not to becoming marxists or agreeing with our position but push them into a, a position where they're like we got to fight or we got to change something this ain't working we got to do something else right and so if if society gets to the point and when it gets to the, the point where enough people are pissed off for conservative reasons right the masses move out of conservatism not because not out of uh out of their own uh, uh desire for progress and, and for socialism they're going to move because their standard of life is threatened they're going to move because th they want to preserve what they have their middle class lifestyle whatever it is um when they see you know their their checks aren't getting paid society is collapsing uh or, or whatever um things aren't working out they're going to they will turn to people even with names like socialists and marxists and and fascists and 
nationalists and whatever, they're going to turn to the people who seem to have answers. People turn in Argentina to that that whack job uh, libertarian guy. When they, you know, yeah, you ask them 10 years ago, would you ever vote for a guy like this? You ask Americans, would you ever vote for a guy like Trump uh, 10 years ago um, uh, or 12 years ago, whatever? They would say no. But when push comes to some shove people, when they see they need that they need uh, there needs to be a change and something different appears with uh, with offering answers. The problem is this Malay guy, this Trump, this Trump guy, they don't have the answers are false. They they aren't going to give them the results. But Marxists and, uh, uh, you know, the Trotskyists, they they I, ideally they would be able to get victories. They will they will win people over by showing them by by getting things that they did not think were possible um, by winning victories and and pushing the struggle forward. Um, it's not we do not have to con convince anybody to see things our way or to become Marxist. We need to have the right message at the right time and we need to have built um, forces strong enough and uh, in a big enough movement uh, to to get us there and to get us to a position where there's there's a independent you know working class party, even though the working class as it is, uh, I, I agree, won't be as big of a part of a revolutionary uh, struggle, um, I think, especially with unions. And I think the PMC will will have to be a bigger part of it. Um, but it, it's going to come down to kind of revolutionary moments. Like it, let's if, if we took 2020 in the Black Lives Matter movement, you had people from all walks of society, uh, in, including Republicans, including conservatives, saying, hey, something's fucked up here. If you had hanging around some people with uh, in a strong position who were able to give demand give demands and slogans that could actually bring people into a, a permanent political movement then you have the possibility of that like, you would that wouldn't that would not result in a revolution in 2020 but it would it might result in the formation or the germ of a formation of some kind of party or or something um that could push things forward <clears throat> well, I look forward to having the space and time to properly get into this conversation. Right now, everybody, the goal was just to open this conversation and we'll come back to it. And I hope that everybody is not too put off to find out my true position on things. I mean, I've been loud and clear about it, but it's always in such long streams and there's always somebody who gets pissed off and it's like, oh my God, I didn't know that. I came over here because of one dime. And so they just assume that I hold a position that's basically one dimes or they came over here because of <laughs> sublation media. And then they find out the position is worse than post left. It's like worse than post left. It's not anti, but it is, it's worse because it's, it's like, well, that identity is literally useless. So, uh, what now? And what I appreciate about the people who are subscribers at Theory Underground is that most of them don't give a shit about that. Most of them are pretty comfortable in their positions on things, and they see me as, as uh, the info hazard that makes it so that they know they're safe to be wrong um, and potentially risk being right sometimes because they all know I'm wrong sometimes, and that's okay. And that's ultimately what this place is about. Uh, we don't have a bottom line. We don't have to have fidelity to a party. Um, Lenin would have probably had us rounded up and killed, but we get to be here for now and have these conversations. I know that was my little jab. <laughs> so I we'll hope to have you back in June. Uh, we'll see you on the other side of the tour. Um, we're really looking forward to getting into everything with you. We'll start swapping reading lists and getting into it. Over the next couple of years, this is the, this is the conversation I think we need to be having. But for now, we're about to switch this thing over to Elliot Rosenstock. And so I bid thee farewell. Oh, hold on, Elliot. Actually, if you turn... Well, welcome. But people can't really see you uh, right now because the screen's all fucked up. Yeah, yeah. We'll be right... We'll be right back with Elliot right after these messages. Thank you, Swole. Peace. Thanks, guys. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation 
theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research, and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts, and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing. But first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money and with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. With that said, several subscribers did not migrate from the now defunct app to the new setup, and I'm guaranteed to lose people over time. So please, if you want to get involved, become a subscriber. If you're not even sure what this is all about, but are just curious, then I've added tier zero and tier one for very basic kinds of access to what we are doing behind the scenes. If you don't have any time or energy to get involved, but you do have some money to help support this project from afar, then please check out the Patreon. My patrons over at Patreon make the podcast and public YouTube possible. Thank you. As for once in a lifetime events, check out the new poster for the American Idiots Theory Underground European Book Tour. Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Vienna, Linz, Krakow, Glasgow, London, and Oxford from April 27th to May 25th, 2024. Two events are already fully booked out. Save a seat at an event by getting in contact with us ASAP. Finally, the call for proposals to our conference in Mexico. On What's up everybody, TUCon 2024 update here. It's not happening in Mexico anymore, but it is still happening on October 24th through the 27th. The change was made because a lot of the people that wanted to attend and that were expected to attend said they could probably afford to travel if they had more time advance notice. Uh, so save up for June 2025. 
Uh, if you have to choose, right? Because yeah. uh, other, it, this one that is happening this year is happening physically in Boise, Idaho, because we have a lot of collaborators and fellow travelers and co-instructors there. But you can attend virtually for this one. You won't be able to attend virtually next year. Um, so yeah, if you have to choose, attend physically in 2025. The call for proposals already happened. The writing workshop for proposals already happened. You can still get the links to both of those. Just shoot us a message and ask for those links. We'll get you those. And the form goes live on June 1st and the deadline is June 15th. So if you're attending physically, let me know ASAP. Get in on it. All right, finally, last little thing here is to say thank you so much to my patrons over at Patreon. The Patreon is for people who are too busy to be students or subscribers at Theory Underground, but who want to see more of this free content on the podcast and YouTube channel for Theory Underground. You are the ones who see something of value in the free content being made available here, and you want to see more of it. Your patron pledges at Patreon are a real motivator for me. So thank you so much. Especially thanks to Marilyn Lawrence, Bert Vanderkar, Carl Vanderlip, Nikolai, Sahil Kumar, Suxandra, Darian Large, Tyler Murphy, Max Mackin, Al, Algeri, Ben Rosenblum, Court Atlantic Airlines, Melissa, Matt Payne, Neil C, Sammy Condon, Yiz, and Schwabkinson. Thank you.